Hello, fellow foodies, and welcome back. This is Dr. Cassandra Quave, and you're listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. Today on the show, we're going to explore a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and I think to many of um, you as listeners, and that's the topic of biodiversity. What can we do to support it in our own neighborhoods, in our own backyards, in our own towns? The guest we have today is the perfect insider on how to take some very specific actions to improve biodiversity and also enrich our environment. Professor Doug Talmy is a professor of the University of Delaware, where he's authored 112 research publications and has taught for 43 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways that insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, was published by Timber Press in 2007 and was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. The Living Landscape, co-authored with Rick Dark, was published in 2014, and Nature's Best Hope, a New York Times bestseller, was released in February of 2020. His latest book, The Nature of Oaks, was released by Timber Press in March 2021. Doug is the Honorary Director of Wild Ones and has won the Garden Club of America Margaret Douglas Medal for Conservation, the Tom Dodd Jr. Award of of Excellence, and the 2018 AHS B.Y. Morrison Communication Award. It's really great to have you on the show, Doug. Thanks so much for coming. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. So I had the lucky um, opportunity to meet you in person when you were here giving a fabulous um, lecture at the Chattahoochee Nature Center And I knew after seeing you talk, I just had to get you on the show because I know how much my audience would would love to learn from you. Maybe we can start with just the basics. If you can share with us a bit about why should we care about native plants in our surroundings? And yeah, start there. Like why native plants? Native plants are, they're the engine that drives our ecosystem. So the real question is, why do we need functional ecosystems? And the short answer there is that is what keeps us alive on this planet. We talk about ecosystem services. It's really the life support that allows humans and everything else to exist on on a little little dot in space out there. As far as we know, there's not no other life forms like us anywhere else, certainly nearby in the universe. So all kinds of things came together to allow life to exist on planet Earth. And it starts with plants. Plants have that miraculous ability to capture energy from the sun And through photosynthesis, they turn it into simple sugars and carbohydrates, which is the food that essentially supports all the animals on planet Earth. Now you have the energy that supports animals tied up in plants. If you don't get that energy to animals, you don't have any animals. And if you don't have any animals, you don't have a functional ecosystem and the whole thing grinds to a halt. So that's where native plants come in because native plants are much better at passing the energy on to animal life that they have co-evolved with than plants from someplace else. Plants want to take that energy and use it for their own growth and reproduction. They don't want to share it. So they protect their tissues, usually with nasty tasting compounds. uh, And that prevents most of the animal life and the, the insects, which are crucial in terms of passing that energy on from eating those plants. Insects have been around a long time, so they have developed very specialized adaptations that allow them to get around those plant defenses, but usually only the defenses of one or two plant lineages. So when you bring a plant in from Asia or from South America, our insects have never seen it before. They don't have the adaptations necessary to access all the energy in those plants. So those plants are in our yards. They're in our, our, most of them are invasive species in our woodlots and they're not passing on any of their energy, which that starts to devastate local food webs. It's a very long-winded answer to saying why <laughs> native plants are, are the way to go. If we don't have the natives that share their energy, everything stops. Yeah. So it's all about that, that intricate food web. It's funny, I think a lot of people spend a lot of time when they think about bugs, it's usually bugs from the context of them being pests. But you're an entomologist and you have a much richer, I think, appreciation for the importance of insects in our environment. So maybe can you spend a little bit of time about telling us about that? Like, why are insects so important to our environment, to these food webs? 
So you just reflected the culture right there by calling them bugs. <laughs> yes. A bug is a disease or it's something that infects our computers, but it's all, that's a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. um, now there are something called true bugs. That's one order of insects, but we like to use the word insect because most insects, as E.O. Wilson says, they are the little things that run the world. And without them, we lost insects on this planet, just like we lost the plants, we, everything would grind to a halt. Because first of all, 90% of our flowering plants depend on pollinators. And most of those pollinators are insects. So if we lost insects, we'd lose most of the plants. And if we lost most of the plants, everything that we just talked about would happen. You'd lose the food webs, all the animals would disappear, humans included. So insects are the little things that, that run the world. What was the question? <laughs> why are they important? <laughs> why That's why they, they run the world. I think you answered it there. But like it's they do run the world. When you think about decomposition of organic matter or pollination, or yeah, tell us. I think there's so many ways that they do bring so much value to our lives. But again, we think of them as bugs, as pests, as things that we don't want around. Yeah. Well, Wilson went on to say that if we lost insects, we'd lose the decomposers and the earth would rot because all you would have is bacteria and fungi. Yeah. Insect decomposers are turning over nutrients very quickly in ways that it all happens. We don't even notice it, but it happens very quickly. Insects are also critical components of that food web. They're transferring energy from the plants to animals. Most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat an invertebrate, typically an insect. Mm -hmm. So that's why the food webs would collapse without insects. So yes, we have pests, we've got mosquitoes and we've got lice and We've got things that we don't like, but really they're not harmful at all, like cockroaches. And, mm -hmm. But it's a tiny sliver of the species that are out there. There's three to four million species of insects out there. Wow. And how many pests? I don't know, you know, 20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a very small uh, number. So yes, we don't like them. They're annoying uh, at times, but that does not, it should not give us license to wholesale eliminate communities of all insects. Mm -hmm. We can yeah. target some bad guys, but we have to leave the good guys alone. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned during your lecture that really hit home with me had to do with the food web and birds. So I have a bird feeder outside of my window. I have an office that looks out into my backyard, into my garden, and I love to watch the birds. But you said something really powerful, like the bird food that I have in my bird feeder basically is of zero help to any of the baby birds, right? So I have to do other things to improve the environment for, for young hatchlings. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. Bird seeds important for getting the birds that don't migrate, the overwintering birds through the winter time. We've got, I think, 345 species of neotropical migrants, birds that move south. Why do they move south? Because they're insectivores. They need to eat insects all the time and a lot of them. And up here in the temperate zone, the insect numbers really decrease in the winter time. So they migrate down there so they can keep in eating insects. The birds that don't migrate are called granivores. They can actually eat seeds. But when it comes time to reproduce, 96% of our terrestrial birds feed their young insects. And it turns out most of those insects are caterpillars. So their babies cannot eat seeds. Why? I don't know. They don't have the, the, the physiological mechanisms for breaking down seeds, but putting out that bird feeder to help insects reproduce isn't gonna, isn't gonna make it. And of course, if birds don't reproduce, pretty soon you don't have any birds. So yeah. reproduction is a really important part. And that's when the insects come in to make one clutch of a, of a bird and we'll pick a chickadee because we've got data on chickadees. Mm -hmm. And by the way, a chickadee weighs a third of an ounce. That's four pennies wow. worth of bird. To one clutch of chickadees, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. That depends on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days. Mm. So that's thousands and thousands of caterpillars to get a tiny little bird that we expect to be there all the time. But where are they going to get those caterpillars? They're going to get them from the plants in our yards. Mm -hmm. And if we don't put the plants that make those caterpillars in our yards, you don't have the caterpillars and you don't have the chickadees. You don't have the tip mice. You don't have all the other birds, the cardinals and all the blue jays, the things we expect to be around. They all require insects and those insects come from plants. So plant choice becomes really important. Plant choice becomes important. And supporting biodiversity is also a part of that. Why do we need biodiversity? 
in our habitats. There was a recent State of the World's Plants and Fungi report that came out in 2023. And some of those numbers, I was just reading it through it today again and reflecting on some of the figures. But one of the figures is that 45% of all flowering plants are at estimated to be at risk of extinction. We are facing extinction possibilities like we never have before. What does that mean? So what if we only have a few hundred species of plants? Could we survive on a planet like that as humans? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, in the long term, no, we can't. Way back in 1955, I think it was, a a theoretical ecologist, Robert MacArthur, was sitting in his theoretical chair and he said, the number of species in an ecosystem determines how productive it is. So in other words, how many ecosystem services is it creating and how stable it is. And if you add species, it becomes more productive and more stable. And if you take species away, it becomes less productive, less, less stable. And that's the crux of it. Now he didn't test that. He actually, he, he died very young from a brain tumor or something, but in the ensuing years, people have tested that. It turns out he was exactly right. The number of units, species interacting with each other in an ecosystem determines how healthy that ecosystem is. And that's because of a number of factors. First of all, there's something called redundancy. So let's talk about pollinators number of bee species will pollinate the same plant. If you lose one of those species and you've got enough of the other ones there, the plant still gets pollinated. But if you only have one species and you lose that species, the plant doesn't get pollinated, then you use you lose that plant as well. So redundancy of eco, ecosystem jobs is one of the benefits of diversity. I have, so I have breeding chickadees in my yard mm-hmm. and they're getting all those caterpillars. What if I only had one or two species of caterpillars in my yard. And it happened to be a bad year Mm -hmm. because insect populations fluctuate. They go up, they go down. The chickadee wouldn't be able to get nearly enough food to reproduce. They only live a few years. If you miss a year of reproduction, it could be you're dead by the next year. So you would start to get the collapse of that food web. But if I have 50 species of caterpillars or 150 species of caterpillars, and I've actually been counting them, I've got 1,259 species of caterpillars so far that I know about. I love uh, that well, you even that. Idea. That's amazing. <laughs> it shows how diverse things are. It, it means there will always be some caterpillars there for the chickadee. No matter whether it's a good year or a bad year, it's not going to be terrible for everybody. So that's another reason we want uh, to increase the number of species in our ecosystems. My father once asked me, what good is a house fly? I understand what he's saying. It's, what good is a housefly? I gave him a, a, a wise crack answer. I said, what good are humans? But, <laughs> and he didn't answer that one either. But the answer is, it's one cog in that wheel of diversity. You take that away. Now we're one, one species less diverse. Houseflies are doing things. They're part of those decomposers. And, but it's easy to pick an obscure species out of an ecosystem and say, what good is that? And what we really mean is, what does that do for us humans? It helps run the whole show. And and even if it doesn't directly help us, we need to see it as part of a very intricate system that we need to keep intact. We can't be picking it apart here and there. Or then you lose that redundancy, you lose the ecosystem function. And Yeah. I think maybe this is something that frustrates me. I've been frustrated a lot lately when it comes to conservation and lack of movement within legislation to help protect so many of these threatened ecosystems. Even when we think about our crops and food security, right? We know that there are challenges with bee pollinators, with our bees. And I'll always hear someone say, we can come up with a robot that's powered by AI and they can fly around. I'm like, no, you're missing the point. And do we really want to live in a world where everything is to be pollinated by a robot? This is So there always seems to be some excuse for the reason why it's fine to wipe out this species or that, and we'll just fix it with our technological advances. How would you answer them, Doug? I just throw my hands up, but what would you say to that? 
I'd show them a picture of, of what's happening in China now mm-hmm. to pollinate their fruit trees. They have guys with really tall, la- tall ladders and little paint brushes because they have lost their pollinators in so many places. Mm-hmm. Um, do that for an hour and then tell me that's a solution to, to what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Remember, it's not just about pollinating agricultural plants. Mm-hmm. Pollinators are pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. We're not going to be out there with our paintbrushes and our robots pollinating the, all the plants everywhere in the canopy and the ground. It's not going to happen. We can't even pollinate our little teeny uh, food garden in our backyard. Yeah. So if you lose the pollinators, that if you're picking one group that you don't want to lose, it's pollinators. Oh, yeah. They keep that plant diversity going. Mm-hmm. And, and the question is, what are we losing it for? What is the benefit? you know, why do this? It it doesn't make any sense to me. It's not like we gain something that's actually worthwhile. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Well, I think a lot of loss at the, I know we start small scale, but a lot of people doing the same thing on a small scale adds up to something really big. Some other things that I learned in your lecture were about the impact of kind of compacted ground through, through the standard American lawn of having hard ground that insects fall down from that maybe it's hard for them to complete their life cycle. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And also insect management within yards and this idea of mosquito spraying, what are the risks to our pollinators through those different elements of just how we run our yards? All right, let's start with the mosquito fogging because it's a booming industry around around the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the mosquito foggers say, it's okay, don't worry, because what we're fogging is a natural product and it's organic. And they're right. It's pyrethroids made by chrysanthemum. It's organic because it's made by a plant. But cyanide is natural and organic. Ricin is natural and organic. Being natural and organic does not mean it's not toxic. It's toxic enough to kill mosquitoes, right? So if it's killing mosquitoes, what else is it killing? It's killing all the other insects. It's killing all the pollinators that we're trying to support. It's killing the monarch, which is now, this is the lowest number of monarchs we've had, the second lowest in history was this past winter. And when you have a mosquito fogging event, particularly when monarchs are migrating, you kill thousands of monarchs. The interesting thing is it doesn't control mosquitoes. Yes, it kills some mosquitoes, but about 10 to 50% of the population. And to get good mosquito control, you need to kill 90% of the adult mosquitoes. That's why real mosquito controllers don't target the adults. They target the larvae. They control the larvae, typically with a product called Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural bacterium that kills aquatic diptera. And you try to, what you do is get mosquitoes to breed in a particular place and then put some Bacillus thuringiensis in that place. In your yard, it could be a bucket. And you can go to the hardware store and buy something called a mosquito dunk. And you throw the dunk in the bucket and it kills the mosquito larvae. And you haven't killed anything else. So that's the way we we go. You haven't killed your pollinators. You haven't killed your monarchs. What bothers me about the mosquito fogging industry is the misinformation that they tell you. They say it's organic and it's natural and it only kills mosquitoes. That's just not true. And of course, people say, oh, yeah, I want to be natural. I want to be organic and I want to kill mosquitoes. Who wouldn't hire them? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So they're manipulating our ignorance and the best, one of the best things you can do for your yard is to fire your mosquito. (laughs) Fire your mosquito mosquito controller and buy a bucket. All you need is water and one of these dunks. (laughs) That's great. Now, how about soil compaction? Yes. I always talk about using oak trees as you're going to have trees in your yard. Oaks is a great way to start because they make so many of those caterpillars that drive that food web. In the across the nation, over 950 species of caterpillars use oaks. So it's a it's a it's the most productive plant we have. Those caterpillars develop in the canopy, and when they're finished growing, they drop to the ground, and many of them wiggle their way underneath the soil and pupate under the soil, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And picture our typical yard. There is no leaf litter because we don't like it, we rake it away, and we mow and compact the soil under our tree so it's rock hard, which means the oak's there and it's making caterpillars, but they drop down and die. And that becomes an ecological trap. And when you do that across the whole country, it's another reason we've got global insect decline because we're just we're not making habitable places for these things to live. So if you say, I don't want any caterpillars, okay, let's call them bird food. 
this is the same person that goes out and buys seed all winter long and then starves the bird when they're reproducing. They can't eat the seed. They need the caterpillars from the plants. Your plants are bird feeders if you pick the right plants. And when you talk to people that way, they say, oh, okay, I can do this. And I show pretty pictures of caterpillars. And what I hear most often is, I can never find them. How do you find those caterpillars? So people shouldn't worry about the caterpillars eating everything. The birds have eaten the caterpillars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is, it is hard to find them a lot of the times because the birds have gotten there first. Yeah. I tell you, after this workshop, this symposium, I came home and I told my husband, we have to build bigger beds around our trees because we do have oaks in our yard. But we are very guilty of the whole mowing right up to the tree and having that compacted ground. And, and I love the idea of just creating a larger bed where we can plant some flowers, wildflowers, or just have some shrubs or things under there that will have more of a natural place for these insects to thrive. And it's also a great way to reduce your amount of lawn coverage. I think this is another interesting concept maybe you can elaborate on is what our largest crop in the U.S. is. It's not what most people think. Yeah, it's lawn, 44 <laughs> million acres of lawn uh, in this country, which is bigger than all of New England combined. Wow. And that's 44 million acres dedicated to a status symbol. And we're not going to get rid of status symbols, but we can change our status symbols. I recommend cutting the area of lawn in half. So if you have a yard, can you reduce the area of lawn a little bit, but half is a great target? I don't advocate getting rid of lawn. It's a perfect plant to walk on. So figure out where you really walk. It's a cue for care. The lawn you keep is going to be manicured. It shows your neighbors that you get it. You're with the program and you're still a good person, <laughs> but you're going to have more plants in your yard. You're going to help the chickadee. You're going to help those caterpillars get underground. You're going to sequester carbon because lawn doesn't. You're going to manage the watershed because lawn doesn't. Lawn wrecks the watershed you're going to maintain the food web. Again, lawn contributes nothing to the food web. And you're going to help those pollinators. All those things happen outside of lawn. Lawn is the worst choice in terms of accomplishing those four vital ecosystem services that every yard has to produce. Because, you know, you just, nobody has the ethical right to say, I'm not going to play this ecosystem game. Yes, you are. You've got, you're using those services. You yeah. require them. They're not optional. So how can you say you're not going to, you're not going to play this game? You've got to, if you own a piece of the earth, you've got to take care of it in, in an ethical way. Everything you do on your property either helps or hurts the local ecosystem. I always talk about lawns or, or your yard not being like Las Vegas. What happens <laughs> in Vegas stays in Vegas, but what happens in your yard does not stay in your yard. So think of it that way. How much lawn you have, the plants you use, Mosquito Joe, all those things impact everybody around you. And then it's a little, it's a different calculus in terms of how you're going to landscape. Yeah. And that's such a great point. And I think many people perhaps don't own property, live in apartments or condos or rent. And I think there are lots of ways to get involved in supporting your local ecosystem I know you've given examples of these, but I'm thinking of like parks and community organizations. Do you have other ways that people can get involved? One thing, most people who live in apartments or condos or something do have porches or they have balconies and they can do container gardening. Mm -hmm. If you picture a five-story apartment building with apartment units on both sides, it's, it's like a giant rock outcrop. But if everybody put uh, native plants in their container gardening mm. and, and containers on their, their balconies, it could be a rock outcrop with plants all over the face of it, all over both sides. And the pollinators will use them. They're very mobile. They can find them. Mm -hmm. You say, what plants can I put in a container? Go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org. And there's a whole section on container gardening with native plants in the different eco regions across the country. So this is one way you can contribute directly, but it's not much space. You're right. Yeah. I always say volunteer for a, a land conservancy or a park or preserve. Invasive plants are a huge problem, just a giant headache and it takes so much labor. And none of those organizations have the staff um, to do it on their own. So they depend on volunteers. Pick your favorite land conservancy, your favorite park nearby and help them out. That could be the one thing you do the rest of your life. They'll love you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a great contribution. 
It's a great way to make friends, I think, in the area that are interested in plants and contributing to the community. Yeah. That's right. But one other thing, let's say you're 85 years old, you're in your apartment, you're just not going to be out pulling invasives. You still should vote. Voting is so mm -hmm. important. Don't vote for, for the guy who says science doesn't exist. You're voting for people who are going to determine the quality of your life, the quality of your kid's life, the quality of your grandkid's life. It's an extremely important thing that you're doing. And I know environmental issues never make it to, to what, what's important in the voters' minds, but it's extremely important. And try yeah. to find out, call up your the Sierra Club, whoever lists what the voting record of various people running for Congress and things like in terms of environmental issues, so you can see, is this person going to actually support my environment or try to degrade it, try to sell it to an oil company or something? Yeah. No, this is so important. And, and so many of these precious ecosystems are under threat um, really across the nation. There's in Georgia, one of our most recent threats is the threat to the Okefenokee Swamp where they're looking yeah. to mine it. And this is such a, this is a treasure of our state. And I just don't even know it's hard for me to wrap my head around like why this is even something up for debate. Like why is this even a possibility that this would ever cross the mind of being something in the realm of possibility that we would. Yeah. <laughs> they have very effective lobbyists. That's why a few people will make a lot of money. It's not just a treasure to Georgia. It's a treasure to the entire country. Absolutely. It's a treasure to the world. It's a unique ecosystem. We have, I don't know what the figure is, but we have filled in, what is it, like 75% of the wetlands that this country used to have mm -hmm. so that we could do this, that, or the other thing. And to, to take a national park and lower the water table to the point where it's not a national park anymore? Yeah. Mind-boggling. Yeah. It's just in incredible. So I think you're right. Like there, there are things that we need to do from a personal perspective, actionable items, which I think is important to have because it's easy to become overwhelmed by everything that's happening with biodiversity decline. But having some simple steps is really, that's empowering. And you can make a difference. And if everyone starts making a little bit of a difference over time and over scale, like with voting, you can really make a big difference. I want yeah. to turn to the Okafenoki for one second. If everybody in the state of Georgia sent a letter to the governor and said, if you let this happen, you're out of here. And I'm talking about, oh, I don't know how many million people live there, but everybody, yeah. believe me, it wouldn't happen. It would, he would say, okay, this is an important issue. I do want my job. He'd make sure it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. These are elected officials who work for us. We do not work for them. Yeah. We shouldn't sit there with our fingers crossed, hoping it doesn't happen. We can make sure it happens or doesn't happen, but it takes everybody. It takes everybody. You're absolutely right. To, because yeah. As a collective, there's so much more power in that voice. And it's, yeah, it's, there are many small battles and big battles to fight in, in support of this because what we're fighting for is not, it's not just about, I shouldn't say just about, but some people might think of it as just about environmental stewardship. It's really about our own health as well. If you want to look at this from a very personal, selfish perspective, we're really protecting our own health and our own right to health, to clean water, to clean air, to food that's not going to poison us. <laughs> These are all things that, that we have to stand up for. Yeah. yeah. I think the indigenous groups around the world had it right. If you didn't, now they worshiped the environment, mm -hmm. but boy, why not? It is what keeps yeah. us alive. Yeah. <laughs> and if they mistreated it, they were gone. It was mm -hmm. that simple. And nothing's changed. If we mistreat the planet, we're going to be gone too. Edward Way Teal said back in the 50s, now what did he say? <laughs> how can, something like this. How can we, how can we make the land in, uninhabitable for other creatures without making it uninhabitable for ourselves at the same time? And that's exactly what we're doing. Oh, that's a really good point. It's just, it's just the simplest concept. But yeah, these are, yeah. we can be selfish about that. We're doing this for our own good. Mm -hmm. 15 minutes in a natural area lowers your blood pressure. It lowers your cortisol, your stress hormone. And when your stress is less, you learn better, you're healthier, uh, your cancer cells grow less slowly. All kinds of good things happen simply by lowering stress. And that's what happens 
by interacting with healthy ecosystems. Where can you do that? You can do it right in your yard. You don't have to go to a national park yeah. if it's more than two acres of lawn and a Bradford pear. Yeah. So I do want to talk about Bradford pears. This is a really good point. We have these awful <laughs> plants. They're just prevalent in the landscaping. And there are even some programs that will help pay for you to re replace these plants. Tell us, explain a little bit more about like, why is something like the Bradford pear bad for our ecosystems? Okay, Bradford pear, it's, it's actually calorie pear. Bradford pear was one of the cultivars created from calorie pear. It was created, I don't know, back in the 60s or something. And it, it was sold as a sterile cultivar. So don't worry, it's not going to spread. It has nice white blooms, a nice ornamental, and it's really cheap to, to reproduce. So everybody bought them. Then they made another cultivar of calorie pear, and all of a sudden they weren't sterile anymore. They crossed. Mm -hmm. And the entire sterility thing went out the window. So Bradford pear, calorie pear became highly invasive. I can drive from New York City to Richmond, and I could just keep going in the spring when that's in bloom and it is white all the way down on both sides of any road I go on yeah. because all of those calorie pears have escaped our plantings. The problem is it's one of those plants from, from Asia. So it's, it does not make those caterpillars that we need or any of the other insects. Mm -hmm. And it pushes out by being invasive, it pushes out the native plants that do. Now this whole invasive species thing is exasperated by the overabundance of deer because white-tailed deer like our native plants, just like the insects do, yes. and they avoid the non-natives. They don't eat the calorie pear. They don't eat the privet. They don't eat the, the burning bush and the barberry and the bush honeysuckle, which is absolutely everywhere. And they eat the natives and that pushes the competitive balance against our native plants. A lot of people say, well, they've won the battle. They're the better plant. They haven't won any battle. They've, it's cheating. They won the battle. Yeah, exactly. We've given them a competitive advantage. Yeah, and we can't. <laughs> And win the battle because they're not supporting the local food web. Yeah. You will not have breeding chickadees when you've got a calorie pear invasion. And that's one of the reasons we've lost 3 billion breeding birds in North America in the last 50 years. We're taking away the food that they need. Wow. And I think what's incredible is I think most people are unaware of this. People that are even well-intentioned thinking that, oh, I can support the birds through bird feeders or through the support the butterflies by planting more milkweed that like, but the problem is so much bigger than that because of, of the dynamics of these invasive species. And this is again, where those community organizations come into play, right. To help pull out some of these invasives and get, yeah. I want to turn back to something that EO Wilson had espoused in his book, half earth, our planets fight for life. And you'd mentioned this in your lecture too, is this idea of, or the premise of his book was basically to put, we need to set aside half of the earth for supporting the overall survival of the planet. That's just really not possible, I think, today. What do you? What are your thoughts on this? And what does that mean? It, also, I think when some of these ideas go forth, it, it's then really towards the marginalization of indigenous landholders. And so there's a lot of justice issues involved in this. How do we support life on earth with the land that we do have? Is it so, yeah. He read the book called Half Earth, Our Planets Fight for Life. And he said, if we don't protect nature, if we don't protect functioning ecosystems on half of the planet, it's going to disappear everywhere. And that includes humans. Very bold statement. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that, that statement. Right away, people picture half of the earth with no people in it. And yeah. the other half, that's where everybody is. Now, he wasn't very specific about how we're going to do this. As a matter of fact, he said very little about how we're going to do this. But you're right. Removing people from half the planet is not going to happen. Half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture. Mm -hmm. And now we have 8 billion plus people in the other half with all of our everything. So the only way forward, as I see it, is for people in nature to start to coexist. Yeah. There's no reason why we can't coexist. It's been part of our culture not to coexist. Yeah. We vilify nature. If you listen to anything on the news, it's about nature. It's bad. Mm -hmm. and that's from cicada emergences to the cougar's going to eat you or West Nile's going to kill you. Or It's always bad. If you go outside, you're going to die. So <laughs> that's this cultural bias, which is extreme these days. We've got to toss that. There is no other half of the year. There's no third half to put aside. So we have to learn 
not just to live with nature, but nature has to thrive. We have to have functioning ecosystems right where we live. So everywhere, not just our parks and our preserves, but on that two acre lawn that you've got too, we've got to turn it into a functional ecosystem. And believe me, we have done that at my house and it is rewarding. It is tons of fun. You can say, well, I, don't, I don't have time. I don't have the money. But first of all, it didn't cost us anything to do it. But I get it with the time thing. That's why I want to create a new industry. We'll call them ecological landscapers. You hire them and they come do it. You don't have to have the knowledge. They'll pick the right plants. They'll manage it. Any landscape requires maintenance. It's not that a lot of people think native landscaping is no landscaping. You just let it go. That's not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But we do need this new industry for most of the people who aren't going to, they don't garden. They're, they're doing their busy lives. So if you're looking for a career, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. Yeah, having native plants yeah, and the expertise to be able to manage it. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit more about your initiative called .org. This is really, I think, a really special resource. Can you tell us a little bit more about what folks can find on that resource and how they might get involved if they're interested in trying to implement some of these things that we've talked about today? Yeah, we have a small nonprofit called homegrownnationalpark.org, and we designed it with the idea. It came from the idea of cutting the area of lawn in half. Mm -hmm. So we have 40 million acres and we cut that in half. That gives us 20 million acres we can restore right at home just by having less lawn. And if you look at how big 20 million acres is, it's bigger than all of our major national parks added up together. Wow. So Homegrown National Park would be the biggest park in the country. But what the, the goal really is to get the message. It's to mobilize a grassroots movement towards conservation. We want the message that everybody, particularly property owners, is, are responsible for the property that they own. Mm -hmm. Ecologically speaking, that's going to be the future of conservation. We want to mobilize millions and millions of people to just taking care of their own property. That um, reduces the, the effort to something that's manageable. If you own 100 acres, you probably have the resources to deal with 100 acres. But if you own a quarter of an acre, you can deal with that very easily. But if everybody did it, we would have ecologically sound landscaping on 78% of the country immediately, because that's how much is privately owned, on 85% east of the Mississippi. So it's that message that you are responsible for good earth stewardship. We want that to go viral using social media and other tricks of the communication trade on our website, Homegrown National Park. We have a, a picture of the, the map of uh, the U.S. We call it the biodiversity map. And what you do is you register your property on the map, the, the location, and then the amount of area that you're going to be a good steward of. Maybe you really are going to shrink the lawn a little bit. Maybe you're going to plant an oak tree. Maybe you're going to put an aster in a flower pot. Then your little piece of your county lights up with a firefly. And we want the whole country to light up. Nice. Um, that's what Homegrown National Park is all about. I love it. I love it. It's such a great idea. And like I said, lots of great resources there. Doug, thank you so much for, for coming on the show and sharing your knowledge about the importance of biodiversity in native plants and ecosystem services to our food webs, to our planetary health, to our human health. I think this was really valuable. Oh, I appreciate it. And then, by the way, you're a good podcaster. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious recorded for you today on Squadcast. You can find this and all of our other shows on foodiepharmacology.com. I want to encourage you to check out the site. You can also find some fun swag to buy there and support the show. Thanks to our producers, to Rob Cohen and Christine Roth for putting on a great show for you each and every week. And thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in. Again, to learn more about this topic, head over to homegrownnationalpark.org and pick up some of Doug's books. They're really incredible and inspiring. And you can find those on his website or look under Doug Talamy. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time.